Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Craig. I'm an alcoholic. (laughs) Really good to be here. Now you're going to hear the truth. What the hell was going on every minute? <laughs> Except for 1975. I didn't know one. <laughs> what an incredible thrill it is to, uh, to be here. Be sober today. And to see all the sobriety in this room is just fantastic. It's humbling. Um, that was so beautiful, this, Katie, what you did in the signing of the book. And congratulations on the newcomer and all the newcomers. And congratulations to the people with time we got today. And uh, that's about it, isn't it? You know? <laughs> Keep coming back. It's been great to be here. My first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, I had maybe 15 minutes, and uh, Dory was with me. It was the Palm Springs Convention, the Roundup in Palm Springs, and Chuck C. was the featured speaker. And they didn't have a place for me to reside, to sit down, so I just laid down right here (laughs) in front. I felt privileged even then. And Chuck C. was there, Clancy was there, and all these people. And uh, they uh, introduced Chuck C., and he comes out in a wheelchair, and he had an oxygen tank, and he had the, you know, the nose pieces. And basically what happened was, as I was lying there, there was a standing ovation. Chuck C., and everybody stood up, and I thought, my God, you know, he, he looks uh, terrible. And... Uh, <laughs> He basically got up out of the wheelchair and he said, uh, keep coming back. (laughs) And he sat down and people just went nuts. (laughs) Nuts. And I thought, you know, this is the craziest son of a bitchin' program I have ever seen in my life. (laughs) You know, I'm going to be an invalid. I'm going to have an oxygen tank. I'm going to say, keep coming back. People are going to applaud, and I'm going to want to drink. I mean, what is the... (laughs) The great fact is just this, and nothing less, that we have had deep and effective spiritual experiences which have revolutionized our whole attitude toward life, toward our fellows, and towards God's universe. The central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. He has commenced to accomplish those things for us which we could never do for ourselves. That's what's happened to me in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I started drinking when I was 13 years old. I'm from Spokane, Washington. I don't know if my parents were alcoholics. They were crazy. (laughs) But I don't know, and I'm not sure it really matters. Um, But I started drinking when I was 13. I stole beer from my parents. And, uh, you know, in Spokane, Washington, and growing up in those days, it was idyllic. It was we had a park a block and a half from our house. Uh, In the winter, we would go skating on the ponds, and I'd come home, and my mother would would make hot chocolate with marshmallows in them, and we had a fire, and it was a Christmas tree, and it smelled of fur, and it was lit perfectly. And she used to make those icicles, you know, so straight. And she used to smooth each one. I said, hell, she used to iron my shorts. And it was, <laughs> um, 
wonderful and beautiful and autumn would roll around and you'd have the you know the the full moons and you'd have these glorious indian summers and this wonderful uh aroma of leaves as you would ride your bicycle through them and sometimes you'd put cards on the spokes of your bike and it would sound like a motorcycle and <laughs> you'd visit your friends down the street and everybody knew hey craig how you doing and, you know it was like a prairie home companion it was just a wonderful <laughs> wonderful existence and there was always something warm and wonderful at home there wasn't too many fights you know there wasn't uh, some kind of weird thing going on in somebody's life that I knew about it was just wonderful and by the time I was 18 I could hardly wait to get the fuck out of there but I mean it was <laughs> a, an incredible It just didn't feel right. It just didn't feel right. It, it didn't have... Something was missing. But I always felt, as a child, detached and lonely and afraid and frightened and totally... Uh, I th it was sure I was adopted, and uh, I couldn't have come from those two people, and it just didn't fit in anyway. But the point being is that I stole that beer, and the first thing I remember about doing, uh, stealing it and was not the, uh, the guilt or the remorse for, for stealing it. It was the fact that I threw up. And from the time I was 13 till the time I graduated high school, I don't think I ever kept a six-pack of beer down. And I remember telling some friends of mine, because they were hesitant to take me with them when they went out drinking. <laughs> <laughs> they thought, well, what is the problem? And I says, you know, I could be allergic to uh, <laughs> to hops. I could be allergic to hops. Or it could be yeast. You know, it could be the yeast thing. But because I and I tried switching, you know, we drank Olympia uh, from Tumwater, and maybe it was the Tumwater, whatever the hell that was. You know, I tried Rainier, and that didn't taste very good. You know, I tried all the beers that they had going back then, and, and nothing really worked, you know. I mean, it was, and I got a lot of headaches, and so I didn't, I, you know, I wasn't a, you know, I just didn't fit in, but I drank to fit in. That's what I did, and fight, you know, you had to fight and drink, and that's what you did. And uh, you didn't shoot each other. That was a cowardly way to, I mean, my God, anyway, but... You know, we fought and we drank, and then we drove around our cars, and then we stole our, our parents' cars when we got the chance. And um, my dad was dying uh, from emphysema, and so by the time I was 17 or 18, I was a, a, in full-fledged denial of what was going on in the back bedroom. And this was a, a tall, strapping Norwegian man that had, um, that had. I think as a, a, a boy had worked in the mines and had gotten in a sulfa mine. And to this day, I'm allergic to sulfa, but I'm not sure what caused it, but it was probably smoke, whatever, he's dying. And I couldn't bring kids home to introduce him to my dad. So it was this kind of, my mom wouldn't explain to me. You know, she's losing her life mate. And, and she didn't have reasons for what was going on and, and how to feel. So I, I, I went through high school with kind of this uh, feeling of inferiority and, and, and not knowing. And when he died, you know, I was present, but I wasn't there. You know what I mean? I wasn't there. I didn't know what was going on. I, I, I remember the casket and all that, and I don't re remember specifically. And the next thing I know, you know, uh, I'm married. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and... Uh, and by the way, my ex-wife, Robin, is right here in, fr in the front row tonight. Now, that's a testimony to Alcoholics Anonymous, I want to tell you. We're married, and I'm off and, and, and gone, and I'm just a kid, and she's a kid, and we don't know what we're doing, and I certainly don't know what I'm doing, and next thing I know, I'm, you know, you know, go trying to flunking out of college and not really doing a lot of, I don't have any money, and I don't know what I'm going to do. I think I'm going to be in the CIA, so I went to a, do an interview with the CIA. I mean, that seemed like a good career. I didn't even know what it stood for. But it was, huh? Catholic, Irish, alcoholic. Okay, keep coming back. Catholic, Irish, alcoholic. Well, yeah, anyway. 
I was in ROTC. <laughs> so I figured CIA, it was initials, you know. We'd... Walked out of that school, went to Yakima, and uh, found drama, and uh, ended up loading helicopters for Robin's dad in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and didn't drink or you had no money. And ended up at Tucson going to the University of Arizona on a drama scholarship, and uh, our first child came along who was sitting right there and has got five days? A week, a week of sobriety. <laughs> It's five days. You're not kidding me. <laughs> I don't know. It's whatever it's been. Congratulations. <laughs> boy, I tell you, Al-Anon. al boy. <laughs> Child? Well, anyway. Um, <laughs> you can't heal them. You can just love them. <laughs> Drama scholarship at the University of Arizona found... $50 key marijuana. Yeah. All right. <laughs> In this whole group, there's one pothead. You know, I mean, it's like, come on. Come on. Let's do a countdown. Let's just see. Let's do the old marijuana countdown. I don't know about you now. Beer made me throw up. Marijuana made me paranoid as hell. I can't, I couldn't smoke. I, I, it was terrible. I mean, I had a great 56 Studebaker that I painted day glow red. All of the instruments were day glow red and had uh, tuck and roll Nagai upholstery from Na Nogales. It was a beautiful cherry red 56 Studebaker. Barely started. I got loaded on Speedway Boulevard in Tucson, and I swear to God, I still haven't forgotten. I have never been that scared in my entire life. A guy passed me a joint, said, here, try this, and this is what you do, and I did it. And the next thing I know, I mean, it was full-on hallucination paranoid time. I mean, I swear to God, I saw those lights in the rearview mirror. I said, we're being pulled over. <laughs> he, he turned around, and he's one of those guys that's like, hey. It's cool, man. It's cool, you know. They pull you over. You can... No, I'm telling you, man, we're being fucking pulled over. Huh? Man, he says, you know, like, chill out, man. Take it easy. Cool it. Jeez, what's wrong? I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, here, have another hit. No, oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Okay, so it didn't work. That didn't work. And somewhere in 1967, I left there and went, came to Hollywood on the whim that we could probably make a living doing something in show business. And I worked as a security guard at Wacken Hut in Los Angeles. <laughs> and the reason I did that because they'd give you a job in a day. They didn't really have much of an interview system going on there. Can you stand up? Can you say yes, sir, no, sir? You're hired. Here's a gun with one bullet. So I was sent out to Lever Brothers to guard the soap plant out there in this, the city of commerce. You know, and God knows how many communists were going to be attacking the Lever Brothers because... <laughs> but I was ready for them, whoever they were. I had my and Hut uniform, and I went out there and work in the midnight shift with Heiner Thomas, who had once knocked out Archie Moore and was still there in the bell from the fourth round. And um, Heiner became one of my dearest friends. But anyway, we're out there guarding Lever Brothers, and I'm thinking about this one bullet thing, and I'm thinking now... If somebody attacks Lever Brothers, I guess that bullet's for me. <laughs> oh. I had an inflated sense of uh, who I was. <laughs> so anyway, 
Left Lieber Brothers and got another uh, scholarship at the Oxford Playhouse in, uh, in Los Angeles and, uh, and eventually ended up with a partner by the name of uh, Barry Levinson. I, I really hate to break that anonymity, but uh, Barry's not on, stuck on any. Uh, doesn't go to any meetings. <laughs> Just his own. Barry and I became partners. We did stand up for four years, and then we wrote together, and eventually we got a show called Loman and Barkley, and, which was a, an hour-long show. And uh, to make a long story short, um, I was working for $90 a week back then doing a 90-minute live show, and I had, uh, then we had two children. And uh, the comedy store, I got hired off of that show to go work for another show on network and as a writer-performer and uh, started making a little bit more money, and that's when acid was big. So um, my manager at that time uh, was a guy by the name of Neil Anderson, and he was, uh, his nickname was Captain White Folks. And uh, this was the coolest human being. This was a former Hells Angel who had a degree in psychology from USC. Now, put those two together, and you got a roaring alcoholic drug addict. And he was a major dealer in heroin and cocaine in the Los Angeles district and, and also marijuana. So I would um, go over to his house and partake of, and sample some of the things that he had, which was like synthetic mescaline and blue barrel acid in, in case. Acid? <laughs> LSD? Yeah. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Good old blue barrels and little synthetic mescaline, and let's drive 35 miles to go back home again. And uh, when your nostrils are so caked with this yellow powder that you can't even think, and your cerebral cortex is about to snap, and all of a sudden on the Hollywood freeway you think you're upside down, <laughs> and you continue to drive that way. <laughs> Going home. So that was acid, and uh, that was that kind of period of time. And then it was like the comedy store opened in '73, and uh, a friend of mine, Barry, uh, and I, and Rudy DeLuca, who opened the comedy store with Sammy Shore, uh, would perform there. And that's when I really found more alcohol and a little bit more drugs, and I would come home and have to be uh, taken down and. and uh, well, I was having bad, bad acid attacks is what I was having, you know, trips. And uh, they, were, they were getting to the point where it was uh, unbearable, and it was one of those things where, well, why don't you stop doing it? Well, <laughs> that's an option, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's, that's a suggestion there. That, that, that. But we didn't, and uh, in '73, and so I started doing some other shows. And by the by the mid '73, I guess it was, um, we decided that having lost the house and and the our van had been foreclosed on, because um, <laughs> it was a living space, <laughs> we're going to move up to the mountains in Northern California and get out of show business and the stuff that goes on in a city. Move up to the country and Jeremiah Johnson it and be like the Waltons and we can grow our own food and raise a family up in God's country, you know, and the mountains and the trees and the air and the streams and mountain lions and bears and stuff you can kill and eat them, you know, and so we packed up the van and we left and went up to Northern California up near Shasta and flipped a coin on uh, I-5 and um, you had two choices. At Reading, we flipped a, a coin. You'd go up to Whiskey Town or French Gulch, which I thought sounded rather good, but we flipped the coin. We ended up in Round Mountain, California and found 40 acres and um, built a, uh, what did, what did I, I built a log cabin. That's what I did. Now, I didn't know how to build anything. <laughs> I'd never built anything in my life. But I had a book <laughs> on how to build your own log cabin. 
And I figured if you read that book, why the hell not? You know, I mean, come on. So we started out with a trailer and uh, lived in a trailer for a long time. And then I started building the log cabin. And uh, unfortunately, we had 40 days of rain. And uh, some of the pages in the log cabin book got stuck together. So I missed, I missed a section in there. So I thought I'd start off with a chicken coop, and I built a chicken coop, because if the chicken coop looked okay, I figured, okay, we can adapt some kind of thing, and then I can build the house, and looking like kind of, I just wanted to see if I could build something. I wanted to see if I could hold a hammer. But you've got to chop trees down, you've got to haul them up, and how do you do that? You've got to get a horse. Yeah, I got no power, electricity. I had no power, I had nothing. No running water, no electricity. I had to get my own, I mean, yeah, come on. You know, so we got a horse. Went over there, and old Chuck Bays, who was a horseshoer, the gypsy horseshoer down there in Round Mountain, he lived on Buzzard Roost Road. He sold me a stolen horse. I didn't know it was stolen at the time. <laughs> and I called him Jericho, and brought Jericho home, and Norm Brown, who lived down in uh, Big Bend, he gave me a set of traces to haul the logs up with. So I sawed the logs down with a chainsaw, which I'd never operated before, but I sawed them down, didn't hurt myself, loaded them up and gave them to old Jericho and thought, you know, what the heck? Come on, Jericho. Come on, baby. This horse did not want to, hated me. He didn't want to haul log. He didn't even know what a log was. Well, you know, the log is behind him. He's scared shitless. He runs off. Now you got to chase the horse and you got to get your logs back. And you sure don't want anybody seeing you doing this because you... It's real hot, and you can't, so anyway, the van turned out to be the hauler, and I tore out the bumper of the van hauling logs up, and uh, eventually we got some kind of a house going up there, and I worked as a, a teacher, and a teacher's a, pr a plumber, a surveyor. Um, I logged for a while. I made shakes and shingles. We tried to grow our own food, got water up there to some degree, had methane. Um, you know, things were just going great, you know, and was... <laughs> Just having fun and getting out in the winter and sledding down the hill. And the kids still remember it as like being one of the best times ever. Kerosene lights, you know, and no, no electricity. It was just really hell. But, I mean, it was, it, was, it was up to a point. It was fun. And, you know, and so I'm thinking, well, I'm not using or drinking, really. I mean, I still have the same problem. I can't smoke, and all the guys up there are Vietnam vets. They've all come back from psych ops. You know, they're uh, still here in helicopters going. <laughs> <laughs> but they're growing the best dope you could get anywhere, I guess. You know, I mean, they are growing some stuff. I don't even know what it is. They brought back some seeds, you know, from over there. I'm sure the Cambodian thing. Boy, that stuff was... You, I sat in a trailer one afternoon with a guy. Anyway, with it to look, <clears throat> not drinking because I couldn't afford it. Trying to do... So eventually I had to hitchhike back to earn some money. And the family's starving. Marriage isn't doing well. We have no... You know, basically can't make the land payments. Hitchhike back somewhere in 78, 77, 78. And found a job working for this cable company doing these documentaries. And the documentaries that I did was called America Still, and it was about people that moved out of the city into the country. <laughs> and I thought, who better to tell their story <laughs> than me? And I did 54 half hours of that. In the process, a guy walked into my office, and it was Columbia Studios in Gower, and he said, I want you to try something. And he laid this stuff out, and he went. <laughs> that was it. Rolled up a dollar bill, put my nose in there. Gone. Gone. I was chatty Kathy. <laughs> I knew the answer to stuff I didn't even know. <laughs> I was a new person. 
I'd refound myself, reborn, re-educated. I was smart again, erudite. I could speak well. I had tonality, and it was fun. And you could drink all night, all night. And I found I could work under it. I could, I could actually work with it. You know, you just hide the little handshake and what's wrong. But hey, you know, that only happened rarely if you had enough, you know. So I was doing that, and one night I was out with somebody, and they said, do you realize how many of those you've had? I was a gin and tonic guy, by the way. And I said, no, I, I really don't. I don't count them. And they said, you've had 16. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I don't feel a thing. <laughs> What the heck are they doing to gin? <laughs> Woohoo! I ended up divorced in a situation that was untenable with myself. I was heading downhill real quick. I was performing, I was working, <clears throat> but I had begun this slow decline. I ended up in Bangkok, Thailand doing a film. And Doria came to visit me there, and she opened the door, or I opened the door. One of us opened the door. And she took a look at me, and she said, My God, Craig, what's happened to you? And I thought I had dysentery. You know, I did. But I also had severe cocaine addiction, and I was absolutely gray. I was killing myself. And I knew it. But in Bangkok, it's okay, because that's where you go to kill yourself. <laughs> you can get anything you want. Anything at all, you can get there. And I tried everything, and nothing was working. And so I made a decision that if I could just make it back to Los Angeles, maybe I could get off Valium, Speed, alcohol, and all the other drugs I was doing. And maybe I could be okay. So I took, I used to carry with me a kit, a medical kit, I called it, that had everything I needed <laughs> for instant recognition and awareness. <laughs> and I took as much tie stick as I could smuggle and Valium and Captagons back with me, and I ended up in Los Angeles. And Dory and I are living together, and I'm sitting there, and she's in some program that I don't even know where she goes, with people I don't really want to know about. But she's detaching from me. There's no longer the game, you know? If I come home and I don't have my key and break the window, if there's nobody to play with, what's the fun in that, you know? <laughs> And all of a sudden, it's like, I'm sorry, but I, she's saying to me, I can't deal with you right now. Or, you know what, Craig? Your behavior is really unacceptable. <laughs> what? Why? My cat, Nelson, when I walked in the door, if I were loaded, would take a look at me and go, Oh! <laughs> I mean, he didn't even have to smell my breath. He just said, <laughs> Yeah, he would. He would sit on my lap after I passed out, and he would smell the fumes from the... <laughs> That's funny. So I decided to get out Valium, and I said, I'll do it on my own. So I took three days out of work schedule and just got out Valium. I was doing eight milligrams uh, of Valium, three, three pops, uh, usually every four hours. I was a very mellow guy. <laughs> very mellow. 
<laughs> and then I'd load up on speed to counteract that. So you can imagine the chemical imbalance that was going on. But I'd get off Valium, and the spiders are dropping from the scene. No one told me that getting off Valium is a very hard thing to do uh, on your own. And so the bed was sweaty, and I was with the spiders dropping, and it was just another bad trip. And then a friend of mine stopped by and said, you know what? I'm going to a, uh, I'm going to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Do you think you want to go? A what? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to an alcoholic. So I went. And uh, I said, I'll meet you there. And I went drunk. And uh, it just looked like to me it was, uh, it was a men's stag meeting in Plummer Park in Los Angeles. It looked like to me it was just a bunch of used car salesmen that, had, uh, that were very unsuccessful. It was really... <laughs> My first impression... And a guy gave me a key, and it said, <clears throat> when in doubt, turn it over. <laughs> well, gee, thanks. <laughs> I had no idea what, he was, what it meant. What, huh? So there, another guy that I knew said, you know, how about going to a meeting? And I said, okay, I love to go to meetings. He says, why? And I says, well, because I'll just get my, I was drinking wine. <laughs> I'll get my wine, I'll meet you out front of the place. <laughs> no, 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 we don't do that. I said, I do. That's how I go to, <laughs> so Alcoholics Anonymous, come on. Alcohol? Anonymous? No one knows I'm there. What the hell? I mean... <laughs> Went out there and I saw this guy. This was at Radford in a little church. <laughs> guy stood up there and he said, Hello, my name's Clancy Emerson and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and I'm outside. Well, he starts telling the story of Jekyll and Hyde with Spencer Tracy, Lana Turner, and Ingrid Bergman. And he's doing all the parts. <laughs> I have never laughed so hard in my life. And I thought, God, if I could just have a life back, if I could be that person I want to be, if I could be funny, then I would give it up. But I can't work without it. I can't do it. So I, I thought I'd give it a try. I <laughs> went into this meeting, and it was like sometime in August in 1983. And um, I had 30 days of sobriety, and I thought, geez, this is really interesting. I got a call to go to New York, and I went to New York to do a Broadway play with two off-Broadway, two people, three and a half hours long. was in rehearsals, and they fired the other actor. So I had to go drink. I mean, by God, they fired the other guy. <laughs> How dare they fire the other guy? I mean, he's my friend. And they hired another guy. I don't care who that is. Well, they hired him. We went into rehearsals, and I'm drinking. And I'm kind of keeping it cool. And we're into performances, three acts now, and we're getting pretty good reviews, and just the two of us, and I'm starting to notice that in the second act that usually I've gone through two-fifths of Cavassier. So I'm doing the third act, and I'm working on my third fifth. And I'm, I'm using coffee because that way no one knows. <laughs> Somewhere <coughs> January... 19th or 20th of 1984, we were in the second act, and I had a blackout. And I woke up at the end of the play, taking a bow. <laughs> and people were plotting and standing. My goodness. And I was sopping wet, crying. I looked over at my partner, Ronnie Silver, and he's going. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what is he so upset about? 
I have no idea what we did, but it was good. I mean, people were... Now all I got to do is find the right chemicals to get there again. You know? I mean, that's going to be a problem. I know that. Went backstage, and Dory was there, and she came... She said, uh, after the director and the writer tried to get a hold of me and kill me, she said, well... That's the most humiliating thing I've ever seen you do. And I said, you know what? I've had it. I'm done. I'm through. I can't do it anymore. I was in that state of pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I had no place to go, nobody to talk to. I knew there was a meeting just off of Columbus Avenue at the YMCA. I'd been there before. And I ran down there, ran And I prayed to God on my way down Columbus Avenue, full tilt, please let them be there. What if they've left? And I got there, and you were still there. And I sat down, and that was January 21st, 1984, and that's my sobriety date. But by the grace of God and the principles of this program, Alcoholics Anonymous, that's all I've got. And I've got all of the cares and the frustrations and the woes of being uh, who you, a lot of you, think that I am. Uh, I know there's some resentments about that. <laughs> a lot of you just don't give a shit, and I side with you. <laughs> and... The thing about Alcoholics Anonymous for me is it always grounds me. There isn't a time when I first got sober and I was doing a a series and I had no idea how to do it. I had no idea what to do. I'd always used, I'd always drank. That's what I did. And now I'm on a show and I've lost a little weight. I'm looking better. People are commenting, my God, you look good. Because normally they had to come to the dressing room and drag me out. I had two heart attacks. God bless you. And the guy, one of the directors came, the director came to me and he said, you know, Craig, uh, you know, we're not getting this scene. You're not doing it. I mean, we need something and you're not providing it. And I knew it. I just didn't have all of the resentment, the anger, and the fear, and the frustration. A lot of it had gone. A lot of it had been lifted. I was a little lighter. I didn't know what to do, you know? So I went over in a corner, and I thought, God, what should I do? And he says, a voice I heard says, I'll show you. Thanks for asking. Then I went back, and it was there. What I had was new. I wasn't familiar. I didn't know how to use it right, necessarily. But it was his stuff, not mine. So every time that I'm working now, I get a chance to reinvent myself through him, through this higher power. Because I've been taught that unless I have a maintenance, a spiritual connection, and I maintain that spiritual connection, then I'm no good to anybody. And yeah, I lose it. Of course I do. My ego comes in there. But you know what? I wouldn't have what I've been given today. And most of the times that I'm asked to go to work, you know what it's really about? There's someone who needs this program on the set. Or there's someone in the program that's working there that says, hey, I heard you speak, and (laughs) Uh, your friend of Bill's? (laughs) Hey, your friend of Bill's? And it's like fantastic, you know? It's a, it's a, it's a connection. Because I know the only reason I'm there is because of that. The, I'm going to end with, I'm going to tell you this fairly quick story. I got, my youngest son Noah went with me up to Spokane to visit my parents' grave. I didn't know where my dad had been buried, or my mom. So I, I, I took Noah with me. We are in Spokane. We're going to go visit the grave. So we all got, we got suits on. I got flowers. And my uh, brother-in-law um, was an alcoholic. 
and had beaten my sister. And my sister had died, and she she died of a brain tumor, but also of a broken heart. Anyway, he's an alky, and I've asked Bob to go with me and presented him a big book and all of that. Well, guess what? He got sober. So we're up there, and I'm up there with this guy who's also reinventing himself, and I go to the graves, and it's me and Noah, little Noah. I think it was about eight. We get a rent a car, and we're going to go out and go out to the graves, and I go, where do you find them? And they show you the plot, and I'm driving, driving, driving. Get out there. We get out of the car, you know, in all suits, and Noah's looking great, and I got the flowers, and just start getting over to where they are, where the graves are, and these rainbirds go on. Jeez. Oh, Noah says, well, Dad, you know, what, do you, what should we do? I said, well, let's, geez, let's, uh, let's not panic here. Who the fuck are you? <laughs> what do you see about turning these things off for God? Who turns them on? So we go out there. And these flowers going like this. I'm there to make amends to my mom and dad in the grave. And, Hey, I'm getting all wet, Mom and Dad. I love you. <laughs> Noah, you got anything you want to say? No? Yeah. Jeez, man. God, I've been planning my whole life to say, I'm sorry. See ya. Yeah. Go over to the car and it's sopping wet, and I'm sopping wet, and Noah's just sopping wet, and he's going, Dad, that was really funny. And I go, yeah. Yeah, wasn't that great? Wasn't that funny? Just wet. Well, I'm supposed to go to a meeting with my brother-in-law at Coeur d'Alene Lake at a fireside meeting. So we get in the thing, we dry off, go out to the meeting, and I'm sitting there, <laughs> campfire meeting, Coeur d'Alene Lake, dusk, moon's coming up, beautiful place, you know. My brother-in-law, Bob, is sober, and he's there, and I says, you know, today I was at this grave, you know, my mom and dad, and the rainbirds came, and people are going, oh, man, isn't that funny? Yeah, well, geez. <laughs> Keep coming back. Yeah, well, 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 yeah. And I'm going, I have no, why? What the hell? There's something weird there. Get in the boat, and we're going across the lake to Bob's place, and Bob looks at me, and he says, you really don't know what that was about? And I said, no, I have no idea. He said, Craig, the day your dad was buried, we got to the gravesite, and the rainbirds had filled his grave with water. And I went, what? He says, yeah, we had to wait and pump out the water so we could bury, put the casket in the hole. I said, Bob, that is so my dad's sense of humor. <laughs> that is just like him. That's what he would do. Hey, Craig, look. And I realized as we're, that if Bob had not gotten sober, I never would have heard that. And if I hadn't gotten sober, I never would have been able to respond to it. And all of the sobriety and all of the interconnection of the people that have gotten sober for just that instant hit me. And then it left. And it was like this beautiful cohesiveness to the program that puts this in the same place, with the same hearts, at the same time. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much. 